Welcome, Generals, to a new campaign in Ultimate General Civil War with version 1.28.3 of the JMP mod. 1.28 has been out since uh, June of 2022, I believe, so I've had some time to experiment with it and get better with this version. If you've watched any of my previous videos, you know that I typically like to give some upfront information in my high-level strategy and then just let the battle play out. I've been asked to provide more commentary regarding why I'm doing certain things, so I'll be providing more details in this series. The career perks that I will be using in this campaign are different than I would normally recommend for most players. So let's start out by telling you what I would normally recommend, and then I'll go back to show you what I'm going to use. This will be a Union campaign on Major General Difficulty. If you want to go with the biggest army that you can field, which is going to be a necessity if you're trying to play in static mode, or if you want to just have the easiest start to the campaign, or you want to buy better weapons as soon as possible, or you are new to this version of the mod and you're experiencing a high level of losses, then pumping politics is going to be the way to go. I would recommend logistician, cavalry, politics. That will give you three in politics, one in economy, one in army organization, two in logistics, and three in recon. Politics gives you more money, more recruits, and it boosts your rep point buys. With three in politics, you'll get an extra rep point in your major battles, and with five in politics, you'll get an extra rep point in your side battles. Politics is currently the overpowered meta go-to. It just makes life easier. However, you don't want to ignore the other career points. Personally, I would not take any combination of starting career perks uh, that does not give at least two in logistics and three in recon, but that's just my personal preference. A career point progression with this type of setup might be something like this. I would use my two points from Philippi to get AO to two and politics to four. The point that I get from distress call would go to AO so I can take 10 units into bull run. With the two points from Bull Run, I would get AO to four to expand my army to 15 units for River Crossing and Logan's Crossroads. And I would use the other point in politics to give it to five to start getting the extra bonus rep point from each side battle. With the career point from River Crossing, I would either take politics up to six or I'd bump recon to four. The last point that I would get from uh, Logan's Crossroads would go to AO so you can take as many units as possible into Shiloh. After Shiloh, I would get two points into training. And even if you have no intention of maxing training at some point, two points into it early has a compound interest-like effect on your minimum experience of your army over time. Or in other words, it will raise the floor of your unit and recruit stats up to 22 over time rather than remaining at the base defaults. With my third point from Shiloh, I would do the opposite of whatever I did at River Crossing. So if I had put it into politics before, I would get recon to four now because the AI is about to start using some better weapons that we can recover from battle. If recon is already to four, then I'm going to be pumping politics until it's maxed out. Once politics is maxed out, you could prioritize whatever is most important to you. I would probably max training, then medicine, or split points between the two of them until they get maxed out. You'll have to decide if you want to get AO to 7, 9, or 10 by Fredericksburg. 7 is going to give you a fourth core. 9 is going to let you have five divisions per core. And 10 will give you a fifth core. So I'd assume that most people want to get AO to at least 9. Since you'll be flush with cash, you might also want to get a few extra points into logistics somewhere along the way especially if you want to buy some of the more exotic cav and skirmisher weapons in greater quantities. It would also be a good idea to get recon up to six at some point. Once I had politics, training, and medicine maxed out and settled on whatever I wanted uh, for the other points, I would dump everything else into economy on my way to the end of the game. It's just a judgment call as you're progressing along as to what will benefit you the most. You might want to add logistics or recon after Shiloh before maxing politics or training, but only you know what's going to work for your playing style. So what career points am I going to be taking for this campaign? Well, it really comes down to deciding on a strategy for accumulating weapons. 
As I said already, politics is sort of the meta for buying whatever weapons you want at the beginning, as well as for maxing your reputation point buys. Points in economy reduces cost. Logistics increases the quantities available to buy in the shop. Recon increases the number of weapons that you get from the spoils of war, whether that's from your allied units, enemy kills, or captures. But I'm going to let our friend Mike give his opinion on uh, how we should go about getting weapons. I'll tell you what, if I need a gun, I'll use one of his. Clearly, Mike likes the idea of recon to acquire weapons. We take him away from the enemy and we use him against him. Really? One of my guns? How do you picture that happening exactly? Well, I guess I'm going to take it from you. That, that is just special. Huh. Take. How are you going to take one of my guns? Come on, Billy Jackoff. Take my gun from me. Let me see it. Here. I'll make it easy for you. You can make it not so easy. Mike has said to not make it so easy. The easy way would be going into the configuration file and just cranking up the weapons recovery percentage to whatever we wanted. We wouldn't even need to put points into recon if we did that. If I'm going to go so far as to do that, then I may as well just crank up the historical north size multiplier for Philippi and really cheese the hell out of it and get a lot of vets and their weapons and then disband them when I get to camp. But Mike said not to make it so easy, so we'll be playing with the default mod settings. Sure thing. You got it. Oh. What the... Son of a... Oh. 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 Okay. Let's see what you got. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And a guy like you... I'll bet you have an ankle booster, will you? Mike is now collecting weapons from the battlefield after the fight. That's cute. What else? Wow. And that's impressive. So many guns, I don't know which one to use. How about you? You want one? The big guy here represents every foreign government who had been considering siding with the Confederacy against the Union. On a side note, whether it is acting or doing voiceover work, Stephen Ogg is awesome at playing a douchebag. Anyway, I like Mike. I'm going to follow his advice and pump recon to get the most weapons I can within the limits of the default settings. So I'll be going with tactician, cavalry, business as my starting career choices. That will give me three in economy, one in army organization, two in logistics, and four in recon. Now, this is not the easiest group of career perks to start with, and I recommend that you only do this if you have a decent amount of experience playing the game. You need to be at least decent at capturing enemy units and getting lots of kills so you can farm weapons and experience in the early game. You'll also want to minimize your losses throughout the entire campaign, since we won't have all those extra recruits from politics. Once you get past Shiloh, capturing enemies for additional weapons isn't as crucial. You'll get plenty of weapons just from your kills as you're moving through the campaign from that point. My career point progression will look something like this. By the time that I get to Shiloh, I will have four in economy, six in recon, and five in AO. You could decide to just stay at three in economy and use that point elsewhere, but four in economy gives you a 20% discount. And the fact that we had to buy just so many officers leading up to Shiloh to field the two core with up to 40 units, I find that the 20% discount works out well when I'm buying that many officers. After Shiloh, I will get my first two points in the training and then max out recon just before Gaines's Mill. All my points from Gaines's Mill through second bull run will go to max out training. I'll then get two points in the medicine and then get AO up to 10 just before Fredericksburg. After Fredericksburg, I will go back and max out medicine, and then max economy, 
and that will take me all the way up to the completion of Gettysburg. Post-Gettysburg is when Joslin rifles become available to purchase. I believe it is the best mass quantity infantry weapon in the game that you can get. Maximum economy means that not only can you buy things at half off, but you can also sell things uh, at their maximum price. And with recon maxed out for a long period of time, I'm going to have just a truckload of weapons sitting in my armory that I can sell off and convert my units over to the Joslin rifles for the last 25% of the campaign. Okay, now that I've said all that, I'm sure that many of you are thinking, if politics makes life easier and has so many great benefits, then why are you not using it in this campaign? And it's a fair question. One reason would be just to show you that you can be successful without needing to rely on politics. Politics makes things easier, but there's absolutely nothing about politics that makes it a necessity especially when you're playing the Union. Not using any politics with the CSA is a bit more difficult because the CSA uh, gets less money and recruits from each battle than the Union. So when I play the CSA, I tend to rush politics to five to get the bonus reputation point at the side battles on top of the gold and increased reputation buys. Then I'll boost recon to six and get economy to four. Uh, then pump training and medicine. So it's more of a balanced approach when I play the CSA and I get a little bit of goodness from everything. And you could do that exact same strategy here with the Union and it'll work out great. Another reason for my choice is that I believe many people overlook some of the other aspects of the game, especially the other bonuses to some of the other career points. For example, when people compare politics to economy, they tend to only look at the money comparison. Economy reduces cost by 5% per point for a maximum of a 50% reduction. Whereas politics starts at 5% and ramps up to 75%, plus you get the increase to the reputation point buys. And that makes many people feel that they would never take economy over politics. Well, like I said previously, economy increases resale value of all the weapons that you accumulate. So it makes a great pairing with a high-level recon to sell all that stuff after a battle to buy the things that you want. Another argument that is often made is that the weapons used by the AI in the early game suck, so why would anyone ever take recon over politics when you could have had the money at the start of the game? I'll give you the reasons why I do it. For one, like politics, recon rates of return ramp up exponentially. Weapons recovery starts at 65% with one point and ramps up to 200% by 10 points. So with that strategy, I'll have 200% going into gains this mill, and grand battles give just an obscene amount of weapons as I progress through the campaign. Combined with my max sell rate from economy at some point, and I'll be swimming in gold later. You can see in this weapons recovery screen from Gaines's mill that I recovered 1,177 Lorenzes from my forces, and I captured an additional 6,550 from the AI's forces for a total of 7,727. And I can still buy 2,000 Lorenzes with rep points back in camp, even without any bonus from politics. So after this battle, I could have a total of 9,727 weapons. Now, if we go and crunch all the numbers, you're going to find that the value of the extra weapons recovered here from Recon is going to be just about the same as it is if you would have taken politics and got the extra money. So financially, it's pretty much a wash in this particular example. With Max Recon on the core deploy screen, rather than just seeing the estimated number of AI troops, the Details button provides 100% of the enemy details. I can see every unit, how many stars they have, and what weapons they'll be carrying to the battle. If I really wanted to cheese the hell out of it, I could even re-roll by going back to camp and coming back to the screen multiple times until the AI is carrying the weapons that I want to see in battle so I can recover them. I'm also given additional details about the enemy during the battle. 10 and Recon also boosts the base spotting of all units by 250, which comes in handy when trying to deal with the AI skirmishers. Also, and this is a very minor point, but I'm maxing training between Gaines's Mill and Second Bull Run, so I don't really want all the extra recruits from politics watering down my recruit pool. 
And with my play style, I really don't need them. Again, if you're taking massive casualties and major battle after major battle, or you're trying to maximize your unit sizes, then you probably want those recruits and should be going with politics. In a very real sense, it is fair to say that for my playing style, the number of weapons that I recover determines my infantry sizes to a large degree. So let's go back to that statement about the AI weapons sucking early on. To that I say, well, yeah, exactly. The AI is using muskets, 42 Springfields, and rebores through Shiloh and even Secure River if you're fighting the side battles in chronological order. Starting with Rendezvous and Seven Pines, the AI will start to use Lorenz rifles, 53 Enfields, and some nice sniper weapons for its skirmishers. Or at least that Major General. Brigadier General may be different or it might make the switch a little bit later in the campaign. Either way, I sweep up all of those weapons and use them to outfit my units. In the early part of the game, you really don't need 400 range weapons with 40% accuracy at max range. Using the same quality weapons as the AI in the early game is just fine. You can still lick them tomorrow, as Grant would say, or you can lick them every other day. I absolutely love Harper's Fairies. They are awesome. I get the attraction to want to have them immediately, but you don't really need to spend the money buying them at the start of the campaign. Your money will be better served elsewhere. They're just a costly luxury item in the early game, in my opinion. Understand that this is a game of opportunity costs. You can't have everything, so within the limited resources available, you must choose what you are willing to give up in order to get the things that you want. For me, I choose to spend my funds in the early campaign on the best officers to bootstrap my rookies up to one star and just use the weapons that I get from weapons recovery combined with the base level of available rep point buys, and it works out fine. You'll also see that I spend funds on artillery, and I squirrel away some of the best skirmisher weapons to be equipped for later. Alright, one last thing before we get into Philippi. Most people will say that their only goal at Philippi is to get out of the battle with as few losses as possible. And of course, we want to do that. But I do think that taking that approach too literally results in some missed opportunities if you want to maximize your army that you take into Shiloh. Because let's face it, if your army can't survive Shiloh, you'll be restarting the campaign anyway and going back to figure out how to build a better mousetrap. So, here are my list of goals for Philippi. Number one, Wagner, Walton, Scales, Loomis, and Woods all survive without being killed or wounded. This is my only go slash no go for the battle. I will restart if I lose one of them. The other two goals are stretch goals, meaning that I'll work towards achieving them, but they're not going to prevent me from moving forward in the campaign. So goal number two is to minimize losses while maximizing kills. I'd really like Walton's Scales and Loomis to get 600 or more kills, and Woods' artillery battery to get at least 250. Why? Well, ideally I want the units of Scales, Loomis, and Woods to all get their second star coming out of first bull run. And to do that, they're going to need to hit those numbers at both Philippi and Distress Call, and then pile on another 800 to 1,000 at bull run. It can be done, but you need to monitor their progress and work towards it during the battle. Goal number three is to maximize capturing enemy units at this battle to get as many Mississippi rifles as possible. So let me explain. For every battle and difficulty level in the game, there's a default value for each unit's size, experience, and weapon assigned to it. Variance is a random chance that the default values will adjust up or down a small percentage. Compared to every other battle in the game, Philippi is unique in that there isn't any variance that gets applied to the units at this battle. So at Philippi, unit size, experience, and weapons are only determined by the difficulty level with no chance for variance to change them. For example, Hexamer is a CSA dedicated skirmisher at this battle. On both Major General and Legendary difficulties, Hexamer always has 448 men no stars, and carries Mississippi rifles. Now, that said, within the configuration files, there are ways to increase or decrease the unit sizes here at Philippi. One would be to use the historical north or historical south size configuration settings. 
You could also turn on static mode and that's going to change the sizes here. But if you're just playing within the default settings, each unit will always be the same based on the difficulty level. The 1841 Mississippi Rifle is one of the best infantry weapons you can get at the start of the game, and the Union cannot buy them. However, on the Union side, Scales, Colquitt, and both of the dedicated skirmishers of Stockton and Schaefer will be carrying Mississippi Rifles here, and we'll get part of our allied weapons based on our recon level. Mississippis are also the most commonly used weapon by the CSA at Philippi, but they will only appear in other battles in the Union campaign if variance causes the default weapon to change to Mississippis. Or another way to say it would be, in the Union campaign, this is the only battle where Mississippis appear as a default weapon. The CSA has four artillery here, three dedicated skirmishers, and 17 infantry units. Most are carrying Mississippis or Rebors, with a handful carrying 42 Springfields or Muskets. So Philippi is our one chance to capture as many Mississippis as we can to give our units a little jump start in the first camp, and that's why I like to start with four and recon. Alright, let's get this party started. Schaefer has the firearms course perk for accuracy and spotting. I prefer allied skirmishers get the cover and speed perk, but this is fine. Zook has double melee perks, so I'll be putting those to good use during the first half of the battle. One of Zook's brigades will be going up to intercept Burns' infantry brigade. There are actually two Burns units at Philippi. One is infantry and the other is dedicated skirmishers. Zook's other brigade will head up to support my invasion of the town by firing on anyone that's near the south bridge. On the north end, ideally Stockton will engage with Sill first so my core units don't get fired upon. I'll deploy Walton and Scales with detached skirmishers to support Stockton's engagement with Sill. Loomis and Woods will ignore Sill and head south to start setting up to assault the town. Bristow's battery will be headed towards the north side. In the starting perks configuration file, I have my infantry taking the accuracy perk and Woods has the horse artillery perk. I think those are actually the default settings, but don't quote me on that. Once the northern units have their deployment orders, I'll monitor the southern force to see what happens with Hexamer. Sometimes you catch up to him, sometimes you don't catch him, sometimes you don't catch him but he decides to turn around and engage you anyway. Other times he just makes a beeline for the town to engage the northern forces. Burns is going to be slow moving going through the woods, so catching up to him is pretty easy. If Hexamer doesn't engage with my skirmishers, then I will reroute them to, to fight Burns. We're going to surround Sill and then whittle him down to Wavering before I charge. Hexamer outran my guys but turned around to engage, so I'm just going to charge him since both of the detached skirmishers have double charge perks and Hexamer doesn't have any.
Sill is still confident yet? Hexamer has surrendered, and there is my first group of Mississippi rifles. I will now send all three skirmishers to hold up Burns until Zook is in place, and then I'll work on getting his morale down to wavering. Since Bristow and Woods both have the horse perk, they will actually get into place too early, so I need to slow them down a little bit by moving them around in a loop. All right, Sill is wavering. Time for Stockton to charge and some of my guys can head into town. So we captured Sill which will also have Mississippis, and I can move all the rest of the guys towards town. Burns will also have Mississippis. I want to get his morale down to wavering while I'm avoiding McHenry shooting me from the town. This brigade will start firing on Law and distract him while my guys assault the town from the other side. On the north end, Bristow's artillery and Walton's detached skirmishers will keep Root occupied in the fortification there at the bridge, while my guys take out the CSA artillery and Sills skirmishers. Had I not captured Hexamer, he'd also likely be here too. Burns is wavering, so I'll charge with Zook. I'm also going to charge the artillery with Scales and Loomis's detached skirmishers. They're going to take a little bit of damage, but it'll be fine.
So burn shattered. Davis's artillery and sill skirmishers both shattered. I'm now positioning Scales, Loomis, and Woods so they can just cover the south bridge with their firing cone. Walton, Stockton, and the detached skirmishers will take up positions to guard the north bridge. I'd like to quickly take out Burns' skirmishers here so Zook and Schaefer can sit and recover their condition before I put them to work again in about 20 game minutes. I'll reattach both of Zook's skirmishers so I can detach them again with some topped off numbers. Schaefer is exhausted, so I'm going to turn him off and set him over to the side. I do not want to see CSA reinforcements coming in to engage Zook and Schaefer. I purposely do not put units into the fortifications right now because it tends to cause the AI to move its units to be just north of McHenry's position and they'll just set their firing from across the river and I don't want that to happen. I believe McHenry and Root are the other two units in the opening phase that have Mississippis. I'm going to try to capture as many units as I can
I'm trying to make a clear path to the south bridge so as many CSA units as possible are encouraged to try to charge across. I'll send Stockton after Root. He's surrendered. Since he's surrendered, I need to keep that other skirmisher from tagging him to rescue him. So I'm running a little bit up behind schedule. With 25 minutes remaining in the first phase, I normally have Zook and Schaefer in position to engage. But with those two straggler detached skirmisher units moving by and I'm still recovering condition, I'm going to end up running about five minutes behind my normal strategy. The idea here is to get the AI to cross the south bridge while I move Zuck and Schaefer in from behind and trap them between the two forces. That way I can try to force as many surrenders as possible. This also allows Scales, Loomis, and Woods to pile up some kills on the other side of the bridge. Once a unit is broken, I tend to pull off firing with my artillery because they are more likely to shatter than surrender at that point. Once they are broken, it is better just to use small arms fire to keep the game checking for a chance to surrender. The default surrender chance is 14%, but the game keeps checking that over and over when they have zero morale. Here we go, this is what I want. The CSA is charging. My guys are closing the door behind them.
The CSA artillery is small enough that Zook's skirmishers could charge them alone and take them out. I'm charging Zook's 1st Brigade towards the furthest CSA unit on the bridge, so he will attempt to blow through all of them on his way, as long as that far unit isn't routed and starts coming back this way. I'm going to drop Schaefer into the town fortification here because it will automatically force melee with anyone in the town or that enters the town. That way he can melee with the two artillery batteries at the same time while causing fire and melee damage to any of the CSA units to try to route off the bridge and come back this way. I don't normally charge with Scales or Loomis here, but the CSA has more units than I usually see headed across the bridge at one time. So both artillery batteries have surrendered and going to send Zook's 2nd Brigade towards the North Bridge to see if I can trap anyone up there. There goes Spears. I'm pretty sure he carries SP-42s. There goes McHenry. I know he's carrying Mississippis. And I also got Cutler. For captured units, if you just press route here, they will head straight west, and if there's any CSA stragglers up in the woods to the northwest, they can come down and try to rescue them. So I try to force them to walk down towards the ravine to the south, and once there, hitting route will cause them to walk down the ravine and off the screen that way. But if you know that the northwest woods is clear, then it's not necessarily to do that. I'm going to start repositioning my guys in the south of town up to the north to see if I can finish off the CSA before the phase ends so I don't have to keep any units engaged on the left side in phase two. Again, I'm sending Zook towards the furthest enemy so he has to charge through law to get there. Now Law went down. Harlan is routing to try to get away, so I'm going to send all of my skirmishers. And they got him. It looks like Burns' dedicated skirmisher is the only one left, and I'm not going to catch him anytime soon. 
I'll leave Schaefer to keep an eye out on Burns and then send detached skirmishers for my reinforcements to take him out. That way I can move everyone else into position to prepare for the counterattack. Only very rarely does the counterattack begin in the south end of town, so I prioritize getting my units into place on the north end first. I don't know why the town ammo dump always goes back to the CSA at the start of this phase, so I'm going to send my commander out to capture the flag. By default, I put my two best melee units into the fortifications in the north center and south center of the town. So Zook will take the north one and I'll be sending Colquitt to the south one. That rocky outcropping will slow down troop movement, so I try to send them around the rocks. I also try to avoid moving them through buildings or planted fields because that also slows them down. Your units will also move faster if they're separated and they're not stacked up on top of each other.
Bruce and Carl Quitt's detached skirmishers will deal with Burns, so I'll let Schaefer rest and then I'll bring him back across the river in a bit. I don't think I would ever take the tier 2 maneuver perk for my own infantry, but when allied units roll that perk, it's nice to have the bigger skirmisher units. If either of the two 3 inch guns rolls a horse perk, I'll get them across the river. Neither of these have it, so they'll just set up on this side of the river to the south of town. Also, keep in mind that the 3 inch can fire non stop for this entire engagement and not run out of ammo so there's no need to send an ammo wagon over that way. If I end up fighting multiple CSA units in the woods where Burns is right now, then those units can run out of ammo. So I tend to send the supply wagon up there, but it won't be necessary here, so I'll just send it to town.
I'll charge Burns and get rid of him and move those skirmishers across the river. Unless things get really crazy, the two 3-inch guns will pretty much fire at the armored train until it's gone. So have you noticed that my commander's sitting out there tanking fire and not moving away? Well, I never noticed it when I was playing this because I was watching everything else, but I ended up losing my commander. I wondered if it would cause my campaign to end early if he got killed, but he ends up showing up in camp as if nothing happened. With charges, I always target units with the most stars first until they are wavering or routing. If all charging units are the same experience, then I'll fire at the largest one first, then whomever has the most morale. In my opinion, getting your timing down for how much time it will take to stop a charge is the biggest challenge of this game.
All right, now we have the entire Confederate army mass charging. This is actually a good thing at this point in the battle because it causes the AI to burn condition and lose morale. The first charge will almost always be with full condition and morale, but it only needs to recover 50% of its morale to charge again. So subsequent charges will likely give your units the upper hand if you have your morale and condition. While his forces are retreating to recover morale, I can start to go more on the offensive and start to press my attack. I believe that Revere and Hatch are the only two units in this phase of Mississippis. Of course, I want to capture all the units that I can, but I'll prioritize those two if I can get an opportunity. Although this sounds simple, one of the biggest things that you need to do when managing charges is making sure that your units are firing at the right guys. Because they'll happily fire away at routing units while fresh ones are barreling in on them. So just quickly hover over your unit to check where the red arrow says that they're targeting.
Revere is charging here, so I'm going to counter charge and time it so that I can put call quit into the forward fortification once Revere starts to route. So Revere shattered, but now Perrin is pinched between my forces. That allows Bruce to get Perrin and quickly get ready for Ellis. All right, there's 20 minutes left. The units that routed earlier are returning with around 50% morale and presumably something less than 100% condition. So I'm gonna go on the offensive with any of my units that have good morale and condition. Remember that the only enemy unit that can charge your detached skirmishers are the enemy cav. If the AI has no cav, like this battle, or you've already eliminated their cav, your detached skirmishers can group up and attack like death from a thousand paper cuts and not worry about getting charged. They won't last long in a one-on-one -on -one shootout, but a group of them can play hell with whittling down an enemy's morale. Dedicated skirmishers, on the other hand, seem like a written invitation to the AI to charge with impunity, so you need to keep an eye on those guys. Sending Zuck after Hatch. We got Hatch, so that's the last of the Mississippis. Most of its other units have rebores with a few carrying SP-42s and muskets. Wheeler is wavering, so I'm charging with skirmishers.
We got Wheeler. Milroy skirmishers are a cannon fodder distraction to allow Bruce to close the gap to try to take out the artillery. Grant is wavering, so I'm sending Cole quit. Zook has recovered enough to get after Parrot. Now Ellis is charging Colquitt, so I'm going to charge Milroy. So we got both Parrot and Edwards. Ellis shattered. I probably don't have enough time left to get Nelson. All right, so it was almost a full clear. I had 48 guys killed, 159 wounded, and 22 missing. We captured 5,918 and killed almost 8,000 total infantry and artillery combined. Colquitt led the kill sheet. I wanted my three infantry to get 600 kills each. Scales got 727. Walton 639, and Loomis got 569, so we're looking pretty good there. Woods got 244 kills, so just a few short of the goal, so he's fine. I ended up with over 1,400 Mississippis and 1,500 Rebors. So enough to create two new infantry brigades in camp without having to buy any weapons. As long as your allied artillery avoids damage, you'll always end up with four Napoleons and four three-inch ordnance rifles. You may get some six-pounders from the CSA, depending on how many that you captured. So that's going to wrap up Philippi. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you at the next one.